Father Paul Florensky, in his work Iconostasis, talks about dreams. Dreams to Florensky have a spiritual significance as a place where materiality and spirituality bleed into each other. He reasons this through by discussing the flow of time in dreams, the flow of cause and effect. There are times where we may have super vivid dreams, where each event leads to the next event in a very obvious way. Florensky labels these events as starting with event A, then event B, then event C, leading all the way up to the decisive conclusion of the dream, or the telos of the dream, the denouement, as Florensky calls it. Uh, this final conclusion, this denouement, he labels as X. So within the timeline of the dream, everything begins with A and eventually leads up to X, the denouement with events B, C, D, E in the middle. A is the cause, and X is the effect. Where this gets really interesting is when we consider how often the conclusion of our dream, which is internally consistent with all the dreamed events prior to it, coincides with an external imposition from the awake world upon the dreamer which causes the dream to end. Huh? This may be in some cases a, a flash of light or a loud noise or an object falling on the dreamer, uh, but in any of these cases it is an external cause which causes the dream to end. This externality, which Florensky labels omega, is what causes X, the denouement of the dream. So from the viewpoint of the dream, A causes X in a coherent chronological sequence of events. But from the viewpoint of the awake world, it is omega which causes X. It is the external experience of the awake world which is then experientially reflected in the dream which wakes the dreamer. Florensky uses an example of a dream about the French Revolution. To quote Florensky, uh, Let us take one example, a famous one in the psychology texts. In this one, the dreamer experiences the French Revolution, participating in the very beginnings of the revolution, and for over a year inside the dream, goes through a long, complicated series of adventures. Persecution, pursuit, terror, the execution of the king, and so on. Finally, the dreamer is arrested with the Girondists, thrown into prison, interrogated, and then condemned by the Revolutionary Council to die. The wagon rolls through streets to the guillotine, and he is taken from the wagon and his head is firmly placed on the headrest, and then the guillotine blade falls heavily onto his neck, and he awakens in horror. It is the final event that interests us. The touch of the blade on his neck. Can anyone doubt this, that the whole dream sequence from the first stirrings of the revolution to the conclusive fall of the guillotine blade is one seamless whole? Doesn't the entire chain direct itself precisely to that conclusive event, the, the touch of cold steel that we termed X? To doubt this total interlocked coherence is to deny the very dream itself, an improbable supposition. And yet, the dreamer found, in the moment of his terrified awakening, that the metal bedstead of his bed had somehow broken and had heavily struck his bare neck. We cannot doubt the coherent wholeness of his dream, a coherence that starts from the revolution's first stirrings, event A, and concludes with the guillotine blade falling, X. Equally, we cannot doubt the sensation of the blade, X, and the touch of the bedstead metal, Omega, are the very same event, but perceived by two distinct orders of consciousness, dream and wakened. I'm sure that everyone listening has experienced something similar in their own dreams, where you have a dream in which every event from A to X is a, has a very obvious relationship of cause and effect, but when your dream reaches its end, as opposed to the sound of a, a gunshot, you awake to find out that someone in the next room had just slammed their door really loudly, and that that loud noise is what brought your dream to a close. Florensky uses this to demonstrate that time in dreams runs contrary to what we would expect with a Kantian image of time, Time in dreams runs in reverse. To the awake observer, it is almost as if that upon the event Omega, where the sleeper is awoken by whatever external cause it may be, that then a narrative with the telos or denouement X in mind works retroactively to a starting point A. To quote Florensky, Thus, in daylight consciousness, and according to the scheme of daylight causation, this event X must precede A, which spiritually flows from this event X. In other words, in the time of the daylight world, event X should be in the start of the dream's drama, and event A its denouement. But here, in the time of the invisible world, it happens inside out, and cause X appears not prior to all consequences of A, and, in general, not prior to the entire series of consequences, B, C, D, so on and so forth, but following them, concluding the whole row, and determining it not as its efficient cause, but its final cause, its telos. So there is a retroactive imposition of meaning upon the narrative of the dream by the awake world. 
but at the same time, the dream's narrative took place prior to Omega, and it is at the point Omega, or point X, that the two worlds collide. Huh? Kloransky explains that this moment where Omega and X meet is the border between actual and imaginary. Imaginary here refers to the same imaginary of imaginary numbers. Someone more ex experienced with mathematics needs to look into this because I am no mathematician as Florensky was, uh, but Florensky explains that the dream world is the world where actual meets imaginary, a sort of inverted space where time runs backwards. The dream world is a world of liminality, a space between spirit and matter. In the next section of Florensky's Iconostasis, where he elaborates on the implications this has for iconography, uh, iconography being the artistic meaning of spirit and matter, of heaven and earth, he explains that this boundary between heaven and earth, where we experience dreams, where this, where the visible breaks into the invisible, this is where we need to be the most careful. Liminality is dangerous. To quote Florensky, what is true of art and dream is also true of mystical experience. A common pattern holds everywhere. In mystical experience, the soul is raised up from the visible realm to where visibility itself vanishes and the field of the invisible opens, such as the Dionysian sundering of the bonds of the visible. And after soaring up into the invisible, the soul descends again into the visible, and then and there, before its very eyes, are those real appearances of things, ideas. This is the Apollonian perspective on the spiritual world. How tempting it is to call spiritual those image, those soul-confusing, soul-absorbing, soul-consuming dreamings that first appear to us when our soul finds its way into the other world. Such images are in fact the spirits of the present age that seek to trap our consciousness in their realm. These spirits inhabit the boundary between worlds, and though they are earthly in nature, they take on the appearances of, spiritual, of the spiritual realm. When we approach the limits of the ordinary world, we enter into conditions that, like the ordinary, are continuously new, but that have patterns which differ entirely from those of ordinary existence. Here, then, is the area of our greatest spiritual danger. To approach this boundary while still willing earthly attachments, or to approach it without a spiritual mind, either one's own or a spiritual director's, or to approach it before we are, in the spiritual sense, truly grown up, what happens at such an encounter of the boundary is that the seeker is engulfed in lies and self-deceptions. The world then ensnares the seeker in that net of temptation in which, by granting him an apparent entry into the spiritual realm, it actually enslaves him to the world. For it is not at all the case that every spirit guarding these points of entry is a true guardian of the threshold, i.e. a good defender of the sacred realms. For a spirit may well be not a genuine being of the highest realm, but rather an accomplice of, in the apostle's phrase, the prince of the power of the air. For such spirits are the ones who keep the soul on the boundary of the worlds, tangled in the seductions of spiritual intoxication. This is precisely why, throughout all the Church Fathers, we see a consistent appeal to ignore dreams and to not give authority to them. This is because, like Florensky says, it is at the liminal border of awake and sleep that demons will try to trap us in these illusory shells, empty on the inside, which appeal to our perverted desires and imaginations, our earthly attachments. Florensky continues, Time-space sobriety on earth is never seductive. Then neither is the angelic realm when the soul comes directly into contact with it. But in between, at the boundary of this world, are concentrated all the temptations and, seduc and seductions. These are the phantoms that Tasso depicts in the describing the enchanted wood. If one only possesses the spiritual steadfastness of will to go through them, uh, neither fearful of nor yielding to their seductions, then one finds that they will lose entirely their power over their soul, becoming mere shadow of sensuality, empty dreamings of no value at all. But if instead one's faith in God weakens in the midst of such a spiritual siege, then one looks back at the phantoms, and in doing so one pours the reality of one's own soul into them. Then the phantoms will gain great power, seizing the soul and sucking from her the power to materialize still more thereby weakening the soul into further fear and more yielding. In such a state, it is extremely difficult, almost impossible, to break their grip without the intervention of another spiritual power. Such, then, are the elemental swamps at the boundary of the worlds. This disastrous enslavement is called by the ascetic tradition, prelest. It means spiritual pride or conceit, and it is the direst spiritual state a person can be in. The demons of the air entice you at this border. And this is essentially what differentiates an angel from a demon, a saint from a sinner, and an icon from an idol. The demons in the dream world will make the dream a self-referential end to itself. The dream will not point towards anything greater than itself. In a similar manner, an idol is nothing but wood and brick. There is no what Florensky calls transference to something greater than itself. 
Think about a stained glass window. Without light, it is nothing but glass and wood. But the second light comes into contact with it, it becomes something beyond its own composition. It is infused by the light, and not just infused, but it becomes the light. Not in a way that destroys the window, but in a way that reveals the whole of the window which is greater than the sum of its parts. When demons appear to you in a spiritual dream, they probably won't appear as scary monsters, frightening to look at. They will probably appear in a seductive way, appealing to your desires and imaginations, in a way that fixates you upon the dream. They do this in a way which traps you within the confines of the dream and ensures that your life becomes shaped by the dream. The external imposition of meaning by reality upon the dream at the point omega is lost, and you become trapped neither in heaven nor on earth, but in purgatory. And as C.S. Lewis says that for those who do not get out, purgatory is simply hell. The inversion of time, which happens at the veil of the Holy of Holies, on the firmament, the border of the invisible heaven, can either point towards the eternity of heaven or the eternity of hell. And the only difference between the two is the same difference between a demon and a saint. The eternity of heaven is the eternity of communion and always pointing towards something greater, an infinite movement up and forwards, where past and future become more and more interior to each other in their mutual giving to each other, forming an eternal present moment, what St. Maximus describes as an ever-moving rest. The eternity of heaven is the mutual indwelling of point A and point omega in point X. The eternity of hell, on the other hand, is the eternal gap between point X and point omega, where in refusing to leave the liminality of the dreamy veil between heaven and earth, you get caught at the very point of inversion where past and future are meant to connect, but you refuse to connect them. You refuse to join yourself to the ladder upon which the angels descend and ascend. In trying to ascend beyond what you are capable of, you lose the ability to descend. Without the ability to descend, the word ascent no longer means anything, and you dwell eternally at the zero point of absolute zero, absolute stasis, a complete lack of movement in space and time. This is what Byung Chul Han describes as atomized time. Now, Trey has some great videos on Byung-Chul Han's theory of time, uh, which, when watched alongside the podcast train I did on eternity in time, will really help draw a picture of the Christian idea of time. Oh, and also watch Trey's video on Stani Loi's essay, Eternity in Time, which he released, I think, a week or so ago. Watch that. Very good video. Uh, but for now, I will end this video here with a little summary. What we learn from Florensky is that dreams are where the earthly world and the heavenly world, where matter and spirit interact with each other. And this makes sense when we consider the brain, the, the center of electromagnetism in the body, as the place where the spirit interacts with the body. Dreams are the cessation of the body and pure rapture of the mind up into the realm of the spirit. But because of our fallenness, these dreams are not so much heavenly, but rather are more so in the realm of the air, where the demonic toll houses are, that test our spirit, throwing enchanting temptations at us from all directions. And this is why it's so dangerous to become obsessed with dreams. This, however, does not change the fact that dreams are a point where materiality and spirituality bleed into each other, and are a point where God can communicate with man, or uh, uh, they are a means through which God can communicate with man. It's just that because we're fallen, we can't assume that every dream we have is God trying to communicate with us. I will be doing a, another video sometime as kind of a follow-up to this, going further into depth on the role that dreams play in the life of the church today and the role that dreams played in Old Testament Israel and why the commandment from the church fathers to ignore our dreams is not contradictory to the presence of dreams as a prophetic source or a source of divine inspiration in the Bible. Uh, I'll talk about that in a future video, but for now, think about it. Uh, if you, I, I highly recommend going to the source material for this video itself, uh, Iconostasis by Florensky. Brilliant book. Uh, one of the best books I've ever read. It's very short as well. So definitely go check that out. Think about all these things and uh, pray about it, of course. And I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching and please pray for me. Thank you.